Uh, my name is Ariel Paz, and I'm a longtime member of the Revolutionary Students Union. Yeah. And today, um, I'm presenting on uh, natural selection and dialectical materials view on social Darwinism. Uh, the views presented here are strictly my own, um, and they do not necessarily reflect the views of the Revolutionary Students Union. Now, I believe that throughout history, ruling classes have sought to justify and ideologically validate their social status and positions of power in detriment of the masses that they have ruled over. In this class struggle, the 19th century currents known as social Darwinism and Malthusianism have become philosophical cornerstones of the modern capitalist system. Social Darwinists have distorted Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection in nature and mechanically transposed it to human society. My aim is to critically analyze Darwin's concept of natural selection and to demonstratively refute the sociobiological concept of social Darwinism as it is applied to evolutionary biology by utilizing the theoretical foundation of Marxism-Leninism, namely dialectical materialism. Sequentially, I'll expand on each concept, then Engels and Darwin's interpretation of evolution through natural selection will be compared and contrasted. Furthermore, the flawed logic that social Darwinists use to justify social survival of the fittest will be thoroughly analyzed and deconstructed. Finally, the Marxist-Leninist perspective on social Darwinism will be presented as well as uh, how Malthusian thought is intrinsically embedded into the latter. What exactly is dialectical materialism? Neo-Marxist uh, Andy Blunden posits that dialectical materialism is a way of understanding reality, whether thoughts, emotions, or the material world. Simply stated, this methodology is the combination of dialectics and materialism. The materialist dialectic is the theoretical foundation of Marxism while being communist is the practice of Marxism, unquote. However, I believe it is much more than that. The Soviet Georgian Bolshevik leader and union organizer, Joseph Stalin, explains it best. In his words, and I quote, it is called dialectical materialism because its approach to the phenomena of nature, its method of studying and apprehending them, it's, is dialectical while its interpretation of the phenomena in nature, its conception of these phenomena, its theory is materialistic." Unquote. This comment illustrates the core meaning of the term and explains its intrinsic relationship to the na natural material world that surrounds us. Stalin then analyzes the etymology of the first part of the term and explains its subsequent development. Quote, dialectics comes from the Greek dialego, to discourse or to debate. In ancient times, dialectics was the art of arriving at the truth by disclosing the contradictions in the argument of an opponent and overcoming this, these contradictions. This dialectical method of thought, later extended to the phenomena of nature, developed into the dialectical method of apprehending nature, which regards the phenomena of nature as being in constant movement and undergoing constant change and the development of nature as the result of the development of the contradictions in nature, as the result of the interaction of opposed forces in nature." Unquote. As Friedrich Engels stated, quote, all nature from the smallest thing to the biggest, from a grain of sand to the sun, from the protista, which are the primary living cells, to man, is in a constant state of coming into being and going out of being, in a constant flux, in a ceaseless state of movement and change." Unquote. And um, I, I believe that that gets to the, uh, the root meaning of the term. Um, the Soviet Russian leader and Marxist theoretician Vladimir Lenin clarifies, quote, in its proper meaning, Dialectics is the study of the contradiction within the very essence of things." Unquote. And he further states, 
Quote, development is the struggle of opposites. Unquote. Expanding on the philosophical roots of the term, the German dialectician uh, Engels explains, quote, and the metaphysical mode of thought, justifiable and necessary as it is in a number of domains whose extent varies according to the nature of the particular object of investigation, sooner or later reaches a limit beyond which it becomes one-sided, restricted, abstract, lost in insoluble contradictions." Unquote. Here Engels illustrates the limitations of subjective metaphysical thinking as opposed to objective dialectical thinking. Engels continues, quote, in, in the contemplation of individual things, metaphysical thinking forgets the connection between them. In the contemplation of their existence, it forgets the beginning and end of that existence. Of the repose, it forgets their motion. It can't see the woods for the trees. Dialectics, on the other hand, comprehends things and the re representations, ideas, in their essential connection, concatenation, motion, origin, and ending." Unquote. The Chinese revolutionary and lifelong teacher Mao Zedong <coughs> simplifies the concept in his words. The Marxist philosophy of dialectical materialism has two outstanding characteristics. <clears throat> One is its class nature. It openly avows that dialectical materialism is in the service of the proletariat. The other is its practicality. It emphasizes the dependence of theory on practice, emphasizes that theory is based on practice and in turn serves practice." Unquote. This comment emphasizes the importance of Marxist philosophy in, this, in the class struggle that the working class is engaged in, and that of practice over theory. Mao clarifies, and I quote, Marxist philosophy holds that the most important problem does not lie in understanding the laws of the objective world and thus being able to explain it, but in applying the knowledge of these laws actively to change the world, unquote. Materialism, in uh, Andy Blunden's conception, refers to, quote, those philosophical trends which emphasize the material world or the world outside of consciousness as the foundation and determinant of thinking, especially in relation to the question of the origin of knowledge. For materialism, thoughts are reflections of matter outside of mind which existed before and independently of thought. Unquote. However, uh, D. I. Lenin explains it best in his words, quote, the sole and unavoidable deduction to be made from this, a deduction which all of us make in everyday practice and which materialism deliberately places at the foundation of its epistemology, is that outside us and independently of us, there exist objects, things, bodies, and that our perceptions are images of the external world." Unquote. Now, this analytical comment illustrates the break with the conve conventional idealist school of philosophy, which viewed thought, or the idea, as having preceded being, or the material. As Stalin explains, quote, Marx's philosophical materialism holds that the world is by its very nature material, that the multifold phenomena of the world constitute different forms of matter in motion, that the interconnection and interdependence of phenomena as established by the dialectical method are a law of the development of moving matter, and that the world develops in accordance with the laws of movement of matter and stands in no need of a universal spirit." Unquote. Indeed, as Engels stated, quote, the materialistic outlook on nature means no more than simply conceiving nature just as it exists without any foreign admixture, unquote. Lenin then further clarifies, quote, in his Ludwig Feuerbach, uh, which is a work written by Engels, Engels declares that the fundamental philosophical trends are materialism and idealism 
Materialism regards nature as primary and spirit as secondary. It places being first and thought second. Idealism holds the contrary view, unquote. The German revolutionary theoretician Karl Marx adds, quote, the material, sen the material sensuously perceptible world to which we ourselves belong is the only reality. Our consciousness and thinking, however supersensuous they may seem, are the product of a material bodily organ, the brain. Matter is not a product of consciousness, but consciousness itself is merely the highest product of matter." Unquote. And as Mao Zedong concludes, quote, it is man's social being that determines his thinking. Once the correct idea is characteristic of the advanced or revolutionary class are grasped by the masses, these ideas turn into a material force which changes society and changes the world." Unquote. Here Mao expands on the critical importance of practice over theory and how correct ideas become material forces of change through social practice. Now that a basic understanding of dialectical materialism has been reached, uh, what exactly is natural selection? Science textbooks maintain that, quote, in the realm of biology, natural selection is a theory of evolution, first articulated by Charles Darwin, which refers to genetic change or changes in the frequencies of certain traits in populations due to differential reproductive success between individuals. It is the most critical uh, mechanism of evolutionary change." Unquote. Prior to this revolutionary scientific discovery of the mid-19th century, society, quote, generally accepted that all life on earth had been created by God, exactly as it existed in the present, and the belief that life forms couldn't change came to be known as fixity of species, unquote. Darwin started to develop his views on what he called natural selection around 1836. Anthropologist Robert Germain notes, quote, this concept was borrowed from animal breeders who choose or select as breeding stock those animals that have certain traits they want to emphasize in offspring. Animals with undesirable traits are selected against uh, or prevented from breeding. Darwin applied, it, Darwin applied his knowledge of domesticated species to naturally occurring ones, recognizing that in undomesticated organisms, the selective agent was nature, not humans." Unquote. After Darwin came upon Malthus's essay on population in 1838, Germain continues, quote, he found the answer to the question of how new species came to be. He accepted from Malthus the idea that animal populations increase at a faster rate than resources do. He also recognized that population size is continuously checked by limited supplies of food and water. He also accepted that the observation that in nature there is a constant struggle for existence." Unquote. However, there arose interpretive differences over just how natural selection acted upon human evolution. Engels, one of Darwin's contemporaries, differed with Darwin in just such a way. Historian Paul Blackledge expands on Engels' differing interpretation on, on the evolution of modern humans. He comments, and I quote, Darwin had argued that the decisive moment in the evolution of humanity occurred with the development of large brains, after which he assumed the other human characteristics of upright gait, free hands, and language evolved. In contrast to this hypothesis, Engels suggested that massive brain development followed upon the evolution of an upright gait. Quote, climbing assigns different functions to the hands and the feet. And when their mode of life involved locomotion on level ground, these apes gradually got out of the habit of using their hands in walking and adopted a more erect posture. This was the decisive step in the transition from ape to man." Unquote. 
This comment reflects Engel's contrasting dialectical material scientific analysis of natural selection as opposed to Darwin's metaphysical scientific analysis. Engels applied dialectics to understand the gradual, painstaking evolutionary processes of modern humans, whereas Darwin applied the traditional metaphysical method. Blackledge further expands on Engels' analysis. Quote, Once the hands of our ape ancestors became free, then they could increasingly be used to fashion tools. And once the evolutionary advantage no longer lay with hands that could be used for climbing, and instead moved to favor hands that could work tools, then it was only a matter of time before simian hands evolved into something resembling those of modern humans. This fact is of terrific importance because it shows that, quote, the hand is not only the organ of labor, it is also the product of labor, in the uh, words of Angles. After this brief historical background of natural selection, um, I'll go on to analyze, deconstruct, and refute the flawed logic that social Darwinists use to justify social survival of the fittest. Before we go any further, though, what exactly is social Darwinism, and how does it fit into this puzzle? Historian James Davidson explains, quote, from scholars, academics, and scientists came racial theories to justify European and American expansion. Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species, written in 1859, had popularized the notion that among animal species, the fittest survived through a process of natural selection. Social Darwinists argued that the same laws of survival governed the social order. When applied aggressively, imperialists used social Darwinism to justify theories of white supremacy, as well as the slaughter and enslavement of non-white native peoples who resisted conquest. When combined with the somewhat more humane white man's burden professed by Christian missionaries, American imperialism included uplifting natives by spreading Western ideas, religion, and government." Unquote. This comment illustrates the muddy origins of social Darwinism in North America while explaining the subjacent political motives that underlie social Darwinist theories of racial supremacy and how such means serve to justify and further imperialist stands and how Rudyard Kipling's white man's burden simultaneously helped crush indigenous ideas, belief systems, and government. In his autobiographical work, Afro-American communist and pioneering black liberation theoretician Harry Haywood gets more precise about the roots of the race myth. In his words, quote, the new science of race evolved and flourished during the decade of the 1920s. The cornerstone of this pseudoscientific structure was social Darwinism, which was an attempt to subvert Darwin's theory of of evolution and arbitrarily apply natural selection in plant and animal society to human society. According to the social Darwinist led by Herbert Spencer, the British sociologist, history was a continuous struggle for existence between races. In this struggle, the Nordic, Anglo-Saxon, or Aryan civilizations naturally survived as the fittest." Unquote. Here, Haywood applies materialist dialectics to analyze the historical origins of social Darwinism. Haywood's brother and uh, fellow revolutionary Otto Hall adds, quote, social Darwinists have distorted Darwin by mechanically transferring the laws of existence among plants and animals to the field of social and human relations. Human society has its own laws, unquote. Some scholars argue that the application of Darwinist theories to human society is not only irrelevant, but stupid. Gregory Clays argues that, quote, as H. M. Hindman states in the, the Historical Basis of Socialism in England, written in 1883, quote, the attempt made to apply Darwin's theories 
on the struggle for life among animals to man is quite beside the point. Man is the only animal who deliberately modifies nature on a large scale and increases the amount of his own food. To my mind, the Malthusian theory in the present con condition of population on the planet and of human civilization among the progressive races is utterly misleading and foolish." Unquote. Friedrich Engels wrote in 1875, quote, the whole Darwinist teaching of the struggle for existence is simply a transference from society to live in nature. Of Hobbes's doctrine, bellum omnium contra omnis, or the war of all against all, and of the bourgeois economic doctrine of competition, together with Malthus's theory of population. When this conjurer's trick has been performed, and I question its absolute permissibility, as I've indicated, particularly as far as the Malthusian theory is concerned, the same theories are transferred back again from organic nature into history, and it is now claimed that their validity as eternal laws of society has been proved. The puerility, or immaturity, silliness, of this procedure is so obvious that not a word needs, need be said about it." Unquote. So that was uh, Friedrich Engels. Critique of uh, social dominance. At this juncture, after we have arrived at a basic understanding of dialectical materialism, natural selection, and social Darwinism, and what the communist perspective on each one is, um, it would be timely to fathom just how Malthusian thought is intrinsically embedded into social Darwinism. How does Thomas Malthus fit into this puzzle, and what is the current? Uh, the current known as Malthusianism. Marxist anthropologist Eric B. Ross expands on how Malthus's thought has been used to justify social inequality. Ross explains, quote, Malthusianism has become a way of explaining poverty, death, and environmental degradation as products of human population pressure on resources, unquote. Yet, I think it would be useful to quote the late 18th century English economist himself. Um, yeah. So, in his famous essay on the principle of population, published in 1798 and again in 1803, Thomas Malthus lays out a number of questionable claims about the nature of man and infers that man acts against reason when the question of propagating the species comes up. Malthus states, quote, impelled to the increase of his species by an equally powerful instinct as animals and plants are, reason interrupts his career and asks him whether he may not bring beings into the world for whom he cannot provide the means of subsistence. In a state of equality, this would be the simple question. In the present state of society, other considerations occur. These considerations are calculated to prevent, and certainly do prevent, a very great number in all civilized nations from pursuing the dictate of nature in an early attachment to one woman." Unquote. This quote illustrates Malthus's rationalization of putting a check on population growth. But then Malthus inexplicably links sexual restraint due to a lack of means of subsistence to immoral conduct. He goes on, quote, and this restraint almost necessarily, though not absolutely so, produces vice, unquote. He then affirms that regardless of morality or lack thereof, people are bound to keep engaging in reproductive sex. In his words, quote, yet in all societies, even those that are most vicious, the tendency to a virtuous attachment is so strong that there is a constant effort towards an increase of population." Unquote. And, as a firm defender of the bourgeois status quo, he links this natural tendency to reproduce to the misery of the masses. Malthus continues, quote, This constant effort as constantly tends to subject the lower classes of the society to distress and to prevent any great amelioration of their condition." Unquote. So Malthus would rather 
not have us look at the concrete socioeconomic root causes of social and material inequality, want, hunger, and misery, but rather have us treat the symptoms, leave the root causes alone, and blame the poor for their poverty and lack of moral restraint. Yet, challenging views have questioned Malthus's basic premises. Ross explains that, quote, among Malthus's principal aims was to explain the nature and origins of poverty in a way which not only would suggest that there was no viable alternative to capitalist economy, but which would also contri contribute to the evolution of that economy in the form of certain policy prescriptions, which he justified in terms of his law of population, unquote. Moreover, the legacy left by this 18th century economist has not only molded public perceptions as regards the most vulnerable in our society, but has avoided looking at the proverbial elephant in the bazaar. Ross argues, quote, Malthus's most enduring influence has been to shape academic and popular thinking about the origins of poverty, and to defend the interests of capital in the face of enormous human misery which capitalism causes, unquote. Ross then touches on the view that Malthus was a staunch anti-natalist, when in fact, Malthus was far from it. As Ross reminds us, quote, Malthus also viewed population growth and competition among workers as a, quote, necessary stimulus to industry, unquote. Malthus had no intention of removing such pressures but only of reducing the material obligation of the rich to mitigate the human misery caused by chronic or periodic unemployment, unquote. But how could wealthy capitalists legally get away with bringing about such deleterious conditions for the working class? In Ross's words, quote, Malthus's so-called law of population acquitted the property-owning class of any such accountability by arguing that poverty was the natural product of the fertility of the poor rather than of the social or economic system, unquote. This comment illustrates the loophole capitalists use to avoid social accountability for their actions. Ross reinforces his argument by noting, quote, it is hardly surprising that Malthus had no wish to advocate effective human means of limiting population if the reproduction of the poor was necessary for the production of wealth and if poverty was necessary to make the poor work cheaply, the pressure of population on the means of subsistence was, as Marx and Engels argued, part of the fundamental and necessary dynamics of a capitalist economy." Unquote. This analytical comment cements Ross's consistent dialectical materialist of Malthusian thought. Furthermore, in time, Malthus unintentionally eroded his own credibility, though. As Ross points out, quote, but in slowly adapting his work to the demands of the new market economy, Malthus had revealed not only the essential flaw in his own argument, that population increase was only a problem relative to the means of production, but his central and unrelenting aim to justify and affirm the established order of inequality. In the process, he sought to prove that anything that humans might do through their own social or political efforts to redress inequalities and place more pressure on the means of and sorry, I lost my hand. To redress inequalities or to mitigate suffering was counterproductive because it would only increase population and place more pressure on the means of subsistence." Unquote. This comment cinches Ross's argument by highlighting inherent flaws in Malthusian thought and that re redistribution of the wealth is inconceivable under that line of thinking. Whereby Ross concludes, quote, if anyone argued that it was possible to avoid this by changing the social nature of production, Malthusians would reply that this was an affront to the natural order of things, unquote. As Ross so vehemently reminds us, 
the Malthusian arguments that social Darwinists have long wielded to justify the consequences of social and economic inequality, quote, will encounter their strongest resistance from the victims of the very development policies which they rationalize. It will not need to be the intellectual critics of Malthus who play the major role in reversing the dehumanizing course of capitalist development. It will be the poor themselves because no one else has so much to gain and so little to lose, unquote. In conclusion, as the planet steps into the second decade of the 21st century and past the 7 billion population benchmark, the importance of structurally changing the socioeconomic system reaches a critical point. Although scientific findings like natural selection have historically been manipulated to serve the interests of the few over the needs of the many, popular resistance movements have been and will continue to be protagonists in reversing the status quo of inequality, misery, and injustice. In the words of the Argentine Cuban revolutionary leader and Marxist theoretician Ernesto Che Guevara, for this, and I quote, for this great humanity has said enough and has started to move forward, and their march, the march of giants, cannot stop, will not stop until they have conquered their never to be renounced their only true independence, unquote. That's the end of my presentation.